At this point, I'm going to exercise my prerogative as moderator and jump straight into facilitated discussion with the hopes of making sure we get through some questions that as a council we pre-identified as important. I believe we'll have time for questions then at the end or can work those in throughout. But um, for our first discussion, I'd like to focus on the concept of what should be included in evidence-based clinical guidelines. And specifically, we've talked about clinical guidelines this morning in our module, but for this discussion, I'd really like to focus that on IPC or, uh, and biosecurity. So how do we develop these guidelines? How do we rapidly distribute those? Um, what elements might need to be included in there in addition to IPC? So for instance, visitor um, guidelines or PPE guidelines around visitation, and then how do we potentially engage other learning environments, schools, um, public schools or, or other uh, opportunities to distribute that information. Um, so I would like to open that topic up um, to both our panel and to our council um, members as well. Dr. Blazer has a Oh, I took away his topic. Is Ramanand Ram on, you on topic? <laughs> <laughs> I can be on topic. <laughs> No, actually, it, uh, it it sort of uh, one theme. That, first of all, thanks. Excellent presentations, and this was such a great panel. Uh, it, it did strike me that there was a difference between you know whether it was on uh, you know the Clemens Food Group or what you were doing in the hospital, for instance. Two things struck me: there were things that we should be doing routinely, day in and day out, even now, which would work during a pandemic or no pandemic, whether it's biosecurity on the farm or you know the infection control that we do on a routine basis. And I think we need to make that separation and say, listen, this stuff just needs to happen right now at a higher level than it is right now. And then there are all these additional things that you do in the case of a pandemic. The second is it occurs to me that I don't think we can really sort of micromanage to sort of say, here are the sorts of guidelines that need to be developed. Because one thing that that came out in, in, um, in Lillian's presentation was there's a lot of innovation on the fly. And that innovation on the fly is going to be very local context specific because you can't take things from one place and necessarily put it into another place. Do we have a mechanism for learning about things that are, uh, which are what I'd call outbreak specific? So there's a whole bunch of things that is not outbreak specific, which is, you know, uh, what, as Paul was saying, you know, there might be things that we just do regardless of what kind of a bug it is, even before we know what kind of a bug it is. And that we can do. But then there's other things which there's learning that needs to happen. Did that learning happen very well? in the case of COVID, was there fast exchange of information? So uh, one of the beautiful things about COVID is that the entire world was focused on one problem. So two weeks before it even hit New York, one of my trauma surgeons who was very advanced in telehealth even before, because trauma does a lot of telehealth, um, told me, I have a friend in Italy, you need to talk to this guy. So I went on WhatsApp and I texted at least 20, 30 people from my critical care, ER, infectious diseases colleagues, and that went viral. And we had almost 200 people in our first Zoom call with this intensivist in Italy who was telling us what exactly was happening, boots on ground, and telling us, you need to prepare for all of this. And I think listening to, to what's happening elsewhere helps you. Maybe you need to come with your own innovations, but you can also learn from the innovations that others two weeks before already applied. That's one. Number two, sharing information and collaboration to us was critical. I was calling Arjun, like I had him on like speed dial, like, oh my God, what do I do now? I have, um, this literally happened. We had um, at that time, President Trump had a meeting in one of his hotels in Miami and the prime minister of, or the, the, the president of Brazil was there and all the bodyguards and 20 people were in that room. And I got called to advise who should be tested. But the CDC guidelines where you only test if somebody has symptoms and has traveled. And at that time, like, well, you don't really need to test yet, close contacts. Like, remember, all of this information was changing very quickly. So they, that's something that I may not be able to predict. I need to make the decision, you know, in, when I'm faced with the situation. Now, from the infection control perspective, I do think there are certain things that we could do better and that we could prevent. And I think we need strong evidence of what kind of PPE is really needed. When this started, everybody wanted head covers, booties, um, Ebola suit, 
and and we were all scared. You saw the images from China, and I'm getting, you know, sent videos from Wuhan, and, and then you are here, to people telling you, oh, no, it's nothing, it's just a cold. You're all going to be safe. So you have to be balancing that information, and I do think we need to be prepared to, if this is a life-threatening viral pathogen, what's the level of PPE we need? Because we're contributing to the carbon footprint of the environment with a lot of waste. And maybe we don't need booties. Maybe you don't need to wash your shoes. Maybe you don't need a head cover. But there are certain things that if you're going to be intubating and you're going to be doing an aerosol generating procedure, this is what you need. So whether it's HHS or CDC or IDSA or any other common group, if we can come up with infographics, that I think it's very helpful. Guidelines with a lot of wording that people have a hard time to read is not great. You need something that you can change quickly. You need something in an electronic platform that, oh, my God, I am not near a computer, but I can pull my phone and I can access the information quickly. And then if there's something that you can print quickly and I can just send to my print shop, and these are the collection kits. Another example, monkeypox. I spent four hours calling different people trying to figure out which swab I needed for monkeypox. Oh, it's a Dacron. I'm like, oh, it's a this. It's everyone had a different information. So as long as we see a threat and we know this is how you collect it, send me a picture, I can distribute it rapidly, and people will have access to the information in real time. And then if things change, you just say version two, and here is the new version. I think we need to be more using design thinking and how, in the same with the public, I think we confuse the public tremendously. Uh, and I think as we, we send information, we need to think, what does a third grader need to know? What does my healthcare worker need to know? And adapt the guidelines for each segment of the population. I'm sorry, it's a long answer. No, it's great. Anybody else on the panel or council? Um, yes, Dr. Plummer. Um, oh. So from a, from a pork production aspect, um, I can perhaps try to address um, some of that whether we're lucky or unlucky because of this, but we, we've had a lot of experience with outbreaks. Um, you know, porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome. We constantly fight that virus all the time. And so really we kind of have practice in, you know, further developing our biosecurity practices. Um, it's unfortunate, uh, but we have learned a lot from whether it be, acquiring new farms or, you know, having a, a new department come out, come online um, and going to the farms, things like that. We've learned a lot and we've been able to use that information to bolster our biosecurity practices. And so um, I think that is um, kind of a, a difference. Uh, again, it's not fortunate that we have this viral disease, but we use it as much as possible to implement better biosecurity practices. And we're in constant communication, not just, you know, with our team internally, but with other suppliers that bring pigs to, you know, our plant um, on how we can further improve. What are you guys doing? You know, how are you guys implementing your clean, dirty lines? Things like that. Um, you know, at this point, I think we're really very good with the shower in, shower out system with the Danish entry system. But obviously, outbreaks still happen. So we're not where we need to be. Excellent. Thank, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, Elaine said that she has a different topic, but um, okay. So that will, um, so how workforce relates to this IPC um, generation. Okay. Great. So this is primarily for Dr. Redmond, but also for Dr. Addo. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, the work workforce issue. Um, and Terry, you mentioned in, uh, education for uh, IPs, infection preventionists. I just want to say there there are somewhere in the ballpark of twelve to fourteen thousand infection preventionists in the U.S., and they are a greatly underutilized group because they are on the front lines. They are the reporters of all these things, and they're the first uh, ones to implement guidelines and, you know, interpret the guidelines and so forth. So their training is really important. Now, there, you mentioned you, one of your things was how about academic programs to uh, educate. My concern about this is there haven't been in the last two decades three master's level programs to prepare, funded by the federal government, 
to prepare IPs, one at the University of Washington, one at Loyola Chicago, and one at Yale. Every one of those failed because they didn't have enough applicants. And the problem is twofold. Either people are young in their um, clinical careers, whether they're nursing, microbiology, um, MPHs, et cetera, and they don't, they don't understand the field, or they're in the field and they're making a, a lot of money and they can't, they, don't, they won't quit their jobs. So I think we need to have, we, we need to think outside the box about how to get these people quickly, not only deployed, but trained and ready to go. Um, and I have some thoughts and there are actually, uh, unlike some of the guidelines stuff we were talking about, there have been task analyses done uh, on a regular basis every five years to describe what infection preventionists need to know. And those are very well done. They're very rigorous. So the curriculum is clear what they need to know. And the question is how to get it out there quickly. So I'd love to hear, I have some thoughts too, but I'd love to hear your suggestions. And I see Dr. Abo has some thoughts as well. <clears throat> those are wonderful points. I agree completely. I think when I talked about an academic pathway, I wasn't necessarily meaning a full degree program. I think this could be in the form of some sort of a uh, graduate certificate or even at the undergraduate level or a combination of a short term um, educational program that's formal that also has some hands on experience for individuals that would help them transition into the field much sooner. Um, because we do need um, a rapid way to get more individuals into the IPC field. I also think there needs to be some sort of a campaign, educational campaign about IPC or infection prevention as a potential career, because there, uh, there's not a lot of awareness out there about this career, except for those individuals that work with IPs in healthcare. So that's traditionally how we have had most people move into infection prevention is either they are nurses or microbiologists. There is this latest wave of MPH students or MPH graduates moving into infection prevention, but that's a relatively um, new change for the field. So I think increasing awareness about this as a career opportunity and then creating educational programs to address that might help us address that gap in terms of um, finding more infection preventionists for the field. So uh, um, you hit the, hit the nail on the head and this topic is very near and dear to my heart. Because as we have expanded over the years, the size of the health system, I had to recruit more infection preventionists. There is a gap in knowledge in infection prevention. Most people outside this room don't even know what an IEP means. Uh, even when I talk to senior administration, what is an IEP? So I have to explain it. Um, there are many people who are coming out of public health. One thing is to go and do a surveillance in hand hygiene. And if you're wearing your PPE on a very different ballpark, is going into 1984 NHSN. Um, and Arjun knows that I'm very passionate about NHSN because I feel like we're in the 21st century using a DOS system. It's not user-friendly. So I get someone straight out of high school or college who went through a four-year degree to become an, with an MPH, who now I have to teach definitions that change every year. I need to tell them how to go into the system, how to report it. Is this is a collapse? No, but it's translocation. It doesn't meet uh, the P criteria. It's, it's the clinical and the NHSN definitions sometimes do not match. And then there are penalties associated with it. So the incentive is, oh, we, we need to catch them. And it's not to catch them. It's really to how do we identify the process improvement and change the behavior and the culture to protect the patient. So I think there's a lot of work that could be done. I would love to get resources. And like I said, it's all about the money. I don't think you need a four-year degree, but at least a one-year degree where people could come, train and rotate in infection prevention, and then get a certificate degree where you check off all the competencies. That could be accomplished. We also need pathways for promotion and retention of the workforce. So we internally have done that. I go from entry level to mid level to senior level, and then trying to find pathways to promote people so you can retain the workforce. Because I don't do anything training somewhere for eight years, and then they go and they find a job somewhere else because they want to make more money as an APRN. Um, so I think these are things that for a pandemic and future pandemics would be essential. And we can start with high school. But I also think we can do it in less than a year with uh, 
a lot of people who go into the field of infection prevention because they're already, they have a background and the clinical background is a little bit of a challenge with MPH students, but nevertheless, we can do it, I think. I, I think we, I'll tell you, in my team, we have laboratory technicians, we have microbiologists, I have nursing and I have MPH. The MPH has been the hardest. Some of them I had to explain what is C. diff, what is a bacteria, how does it get transmitted? So I'm hiring people and I am paying them to train them because there is no career. With the pharmacies, with the third chief pharmacies, is, is very easy. It's, all pharmacists are OCDs. They're perfectionists. They're brilliant. They will catch any error and they go through rigorous training plus infectious disease training in pharmacy. I love them. With infection prevention, I need to do a lot of hand holding, and that's a great opportunity. If we can train IPs how we train pharmacists, this country would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> With that, Dr. Blazer, I believe you have a comment on workforce. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, Dr. Larson, Dr. Redmond, Dr. Abo, you, you've answered most of my questions, but I, I just wanted to be more explicit. Maybe, Dr. Redmond, you can tell me. So what's the scale of the current shortage? How many people are we short now? What, what's it going to look like in a decade? And again, the question that has been addressed partially is how long would it take to train the workforce to, to get us up to steady state? You know, how many new graduates do we have to turn out a year? Again, those are great questions. I don't know that we have a quantifiable uh, answer for how many IPs we currently need. Infection prevention expanded greatly during the pandemic in a, in a good way because healthcare and public health realized the importance of this expertise. And so we found that um, IP started moving into other areas. So Doctors Without Borders and um, the cruise lines all wanted to hire IPs and they had not hired them before. So we had a lot of IPs moving from traditional healthcare spaces into these other settings. And so it expanded the field, but we don't have additional IPs. So I think it'd be really important to have some sort of a survey um, done to see exactly what that shortage currently looks like to see how many IPs we need and then go there once we have our gap analysis to figure out how to move forward. But I agree completely with Elaine that we need something relatively short so we can get people into the field that's very targeted towards infection prevention and has a lot of hands-on experience because infection prevention, you can't learn it all just from um, traditional classes. You really have to get in there and work with the data, work with healthcare teams, because it, it's more than just um, crunching numbers and collecting surveillance data. There's a lot of focus on needing to do almost quality improvement in terms of identifying um, challenges and, and gaps in our practice, and then helping convince individuals and teams how we need to change our practice moving forward. So it's a very complex kind of a, a field. Could I just add to that some information? Uh, CMS has really done a nice job because they're actually uh, looking at the need in long-term care, and there's nobody in long-term care. So there is a certification process, which has a very rigorous way of training and examining people, and there's a new long-term care certification for infection uh, preventives that demonstrates minimal competency, as well as two other, there's a, another new certification, which is sort of the associate infection preventionist, which uh, certifies the, those who have less experience so that uh, employees actually can uh, be certain that these individuals have the minimum amount of training. They have to pass a rigorous exam. So, uh, but there also also have been several studies to predict the need for infection prevention. And it depends on the 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 original definition of the need was you need one for every 250 beds in acute care. Now it's one for every hundred beds in acute care, and now it's also long term care. So the predicted need has um, increased exponentially over the last few yeah. years. So I, my, my point is that if we want to make recommendations both to the federal government and to colleges and universities to develop this flow, we, we need to know the sense of what, what's the scale of the shortage. Currently, five years, 10 years, that will be very helpful. All right, thank you. Um, other comments on those workforce topics? 
Okay, Dave. Thank you. Yes, and my question on the workforce is, is protecting the workforce and coming at it from a maybe a food and agricultural perspective. I think about the uh, built environment. So probably for the question be for Dr. Lee and Dr. Bender, is there an opportunity to redesign food processing, food slaughter facilities that take into account better HVAC systems, you know, barriers, uh, bringing in civil engineers, biosystems engineers, uh, IP folks to kind of rethink how, or even automation, bringing that into food animal production to cut down on on the use of workers, frankly. I know in Tennessee during the pandemic, uh, a lot of our slaughter facilities shut down. People got sick, our dairy production shut down. If we had invested in automation, robotic milkers and other things, we may not have been as heavily impacted in the workforce and uh, the economy may not have tanked as bad. I want to throw that out there for your thoughts. Yes, so I absolutely think there's an opportunity for innovation. Uh, we've we've already um, really started to explore that. Um, you know, thankfully, one of our facilities, uh, the one in, in Michigan, is, is just five years old. Um, so we we really took um, a lot of that into consideration, and we have employed. Well, I don't know how you say employed. Uh, we've used robots in that system um, for you know since since the plant was built. Um, our facility in Pennsylvania, however, is much older. Um, and that is where I think a lot of those opportunities lie. Um, whether it be use, using different materials, um, just even for walls, you know, um, or like you said, different HVAC systems, um, increasing the, the ventilation in the barns, things like that. Um, I absolutely think that there are opportunities there. Um, Renovating older facilities doesn't necessarily generate as much revenue as building new ones. Um, so there's that thought, but um, we are absolutely always looking at uh, ways to renovate. And um, I can tell you there are, there's an endless amount of capital requests for things like that. And I think, you know, going hand in hand with the labor um, shortages, just in general, you're going to see a lot more automation where, where it can be used. I wasn't sure that I was going to completely agree with Arjun that money solves all problems. Uh, but uh, to 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 that point, um, I think that's very, very real. I've, one of the things that's really been fascinating to look at the workforce, uh, especially in agriculture, is um, what we saw is that automation was starting to come. More dairies were going, I can't find workers. I've got to, I've got to automate, I've got to get milkers, uh, automatic milkers to actually do the work because I can't get workers because of immigration issues. Um, but one of the things that is uh, really sorely lacking that I find is, is um, so my CDC colleagues, uh, is, is NIOSH's budget just got slashed and has not really been able to do any research to look at some of these issues and really to think about how do we integrate and create interdisciplinary projects to actually look at improving the workforce, especially when we think about uh, the, you know, the, the advances with exoskeletons, with other automation uh, issues coming up that really can um, help protect the worker from a, not only, you know, infectious disease issues, but also from injuries. So I think there really is a research need uh, to really look at that. How do we bring industrial hygienists? How do we bring, uh, you know, uh, especially the agricultural uh, folks who understand the systems that can actually explain those, the extension folks, you know, who are actually out in the field to be able to uh, recognize what the needs are and then also then to translate it. So I clearly, uh, unfortunately, Arjun, I probably completely agree with you on the money piece, uh, so even though I'm still working mentally through this argument. You know, if I can add from a warm health perspective, I think that the same theme holds true in in healthcare and in community settings as well, right? How, how much time have we spent thinking about ventilation before the pandemic versus how much time we probably needed to spend thinking about ventilation systems in hospitals? I and mean, we think about it in the ORs, but we don't think about it as much in the hospital, the rest of the hospital buildings, in schools and churches and other types of facilities. So in some of these, you know, the viral dynamics in the air are going to be the same, whether it's in a slaughterhouse or in a healthcare delivery facility. So there are probably spaces where there can be synergistic learning when we think about 
systems like HVAC systems and things like that. So I think we, we need to keep that one health focus in mind uh, for some of these innovations over. Great. And Dr. Plummer, can I just add one more thing? Oh, yeah. I think, um, you know, as, as an industry, everyone is really looking toward automation, but I also think, and I, and I probably should have said this before, I also think we need to always ensure that you don't lose, you know, the people who are taking care of the animals because that dynamic is very, very important. You definitely see a decrease in state mortality or, or, you know, any of those other metrics when you have in increased numbers of team members. So I think it depends on where you are in the industry, whether you're at the plant, whether you're at the farm, um, as to how much we can employ some of that um, new technology. Sorry, and, and that applies to humans as well. It's really using augmenting intelligence, right? So it's not just replacing humans. It's really where, what can we do to use technology to leverage it in a cost-effective way with value um, the, the work that we do and what could be replaced for the safety of both animals and the humans and the same with the workforce by automation and technology. And I think that's, that's key. Otherwise, we're just going to be throwing a lot of technology and a lot of money and not solving the problems. Excellent. Great discussion. I know, Stephanie, you have a question first. Julie, is your question related to this? Or can, if not, we'll let Stephanie go and then you're next. Okay, you're next. <laughs> right. Um, I actually had a comment on guideline sort of issues, which we passed a while ago. So that's why I put my card down. But could I, if I could just really quickly just mentioned this, um, I think there's this tension between this um, publishing evidence-based guidelines, you know, that are ready for manuscripts. I think as Dr. Walensky kind of recognized that that, you know, this this need to have guidelines that are good enough that, you know, as Terry Redman was saying, that people feel comfortable at the front lines, but don't result in us sending every patient to the emergency department to get tested. So I think we kind of rebounded off COVID with monkeypox to say, you know, N95, just to be careful. You know, and and I, I I think that there's I recognize there's a tension there, and that's a really difficult position. Um, uh, but I think that we have to you know kind of acknowledge that going forward, that guidelines have to be kind of dated and updated regularly, and in a way that's transparent to those who will be using them, both in healthcare and in the community. And then and just also on the workforce, wanted to touch on the fact that. Um, supporting public health, the, the funding that CDC has provided to the healthcare associated infections program does result in this watershed effect of having uh, infection preventionists at health departments. We have a skilled nursing facility, SNF, and an acute care facility, an outpatient, a two uh, team um, that uh, go to and support, provided those consultations to nursing homes over time so that obviously uh, that just chiming in that that sustained funding is so critical, but it's watershed also so that we can go into the nursing homes um, and, and help provide that, that guidance. Thanks. Excellent. Julie. Hi, thank you so much uh, to the, to the panel members. I thought it was an excellent session and it went very well with this morning's session. I think one thing that, that struck me in hearing you all speak and even just sort of reflecting on this, the COVID pandemic is the critical importance of messaging to the workforce. And so how we communicate to the workforce not only helps them understand, you know, what are the best practices that they can put into place to reduce harm to themselves, to their patients, to the animals. It, uh, the messaging can help build trust and engender a feeling of support from leadership to the workers, and it helps in management of fear and emotions. And I think in the early days, there was a lot of uh, decision making and behavior that was in response to the emotional reality of the situation that maybe didn't appear to be evidence based, but people were doing. I, I really appreciated Dr. Abbo's um, point about the nurses who made the decision to have the longer tubing so they didn't have to go into the rooms as much, but that sort of the unintended negative consequences is infection. And so my question to you um, would be, can you think of potential federal response actions or policy changes that might help support you as kind of these stakeholders who are in charge of messaging at the local level uh, to message in a, in a rapidly changing information environment? So sort of what the, what we could do to help with that, because I think that's a big challenge, so thank you. So one of the first challenges I faced uh, in, in communication is I'm bilingual, I'm Venezuelan. So I was being pulled, I was on service, taking care of transplant patients, and I get called by 
by the C-suite that I needed to be on television, that how come I, de I decline an interview with CNN and the New York Times? I'm like, do you want me to be on TV or do you want me to take care of the patients or do you want me to plan the pandemic? Well, I needed to do everything. I said, well, I can't do everything at the same time. So that I think having uh, having central information to the frontline providers, I, one of the first things we do is who is going to be the face of the health system? Because I cannot have every physician going on television. We're going to decide who are the people who are going to be representing the health system. What are we going to say? And I was in constant communication with our department, our, our PR department saying, I'm not just going to take any interview. You have to centralize when and where we're communicating and how we're communicating. That was on the outside. I had, the, I have the, the, um, the blessing of working with an amazing emergency uh, chief of emergency response who has a passion for hurricanes and uh, can read CNN before CNN publishes anything. So he's on top of things before anyone and he's texting and emailing me every new article and every new piece of information. It was mission impossible for me and many of my colleagues to just be up to date with everything that's happening. So you get called, oh, I don't know which news station is asking about, what about the CDC saying masks for all? And we were just telling you yesterday, only patients need to wear masks, not the healthcare workers or vice versa. So I'm like, I didn't know the guidelines change. So that is where I think the federal government could help. If there are going to be big changes that impact us before you go on a press conference, sort of gather the stakeholders here. This is coming. It's embargoed. But be prepared because you're going to get blasted, you know, with requests to answer these questions that you had no clue uh, just happened. The second thing we did a lot, we created text messaging alerts. We created emails and we created multiple channels of communication. We went through our county and started working with um, our public response, PR, how do you teach people in multiple channels, TikTok and YouTube and the newer generation who were still partying in South Beach because they thought that this was all a hoax. So how do we work out multiple channels of communication, multiple levels of education? I think the federal government can create some tools that we can disseminate. They have to be, Miami is trilingual. We have Creole, English, and Spanish. So all of the materials, everything that came out, we had to translate into other languages to make sure that we reach our population. You may be in another part of the country where you have to translate everything into Vietnamese. I don't know that. Only those of us in the front lines may know this nuances. So I think that could help. The third one is we did town halls, a lot of town halls with the senior leadership where we would just open the microphones, give an update, and then ask our employees to ask questions, you know, openly. And we did that with pandemic preparedness. We did that when they wanted to know about premium pays. They always wanted to know about vaccine and the safety of vaccines. So we did a lot of education. We are in a union environment. So working with the unions, which is another challenge. And then the jails. So try to convince an inmate that he needs to get vaccinated. And uh, that's another level. So I think communication and education has to go through multiple levels of society because, again, this is a global problem and, and you need to tackle it from every angle. And I guess the federal government has the resources to think through this and maybe divide and conquer and, and disseminate the same information through multiple channels but be consistent because the moment we start contradicting ourselves, that's when we confuse the public and we lose credibility, including our workforce. And I'll echo um, Lillian, translation is huge, huge, huge. And, um, you know, in, in a lot of these meatpacking facilities or on farm, um, you know, we have team members who speak a, a lot of different language, I, languages. I think we have like 19 languages spoken in one of the plants. Um, and so, it's very, very important to get that, get whatever message out, you're, you know, you need to get out um, in all of these languages, but it needs to be short and sweet. And in this room, you know, we're scientists and everything is, well, maybe this and maybe this and what if this happens? I completely understand, but not everybody thinks exactly the way that, that I would think about a situation or you would think about a situation. Um, and so a short message is always helpful, especially when you're trying to put these messages on a poster in the hallway where you have it in five or six different languages. So I think that's really important as well. I think it, it's also really important when making messaging. Um, I really like the shift that CDC made in terms of how they're communicating about monkeypox in terms of talking about safer practices. So it doesn't sound quite 
as much like either do this or you're not protected because what I would hear from healthcare personnel during COVID-19 is that <clears throat> CDC says to do X. And if I can't do X, then I'm not being protected. You're not protecting me. And then they didn't want to work or they didn't want to take care of patients that had COVID-19. And it created a lot of um, distrust uh, with the healthcare staff towards either infection prevention or towards like the hospital administrators, for instance. So I think having some of that messaging when, when the science isn't completely clear or we're still investigating the science to get um, better information about how this pathogen is spread and what is the best way to protect themselves. Having a little bit of flexibility in the language, I think, provides um, an easier way to message that to healthcare personnel because they do understand that we are still looking at the science and that we update that when we have additional science. That's a scientific method. That's what we want to do. Um, we just have to find a way to message that in a way that they understand and still feel safe to continue doing their job. Excellent. Thank you. Carla, did you have a question or did you get covered? Thank you. It's been answered by Dr. Bender. Okay. So next, Armando. Armando Nahum, voting member. Um, one of the things that I've been working really hard for the last 10 years is to bring the patient's voice into our healthcare system. Unfortunately, only less than 50% of our hospitals, which we have what, what roughly 6,000 in this country, um, have adopted that, that concept. I've even published papers that um, actually prove that when patients are engaged in their care, we have better outcomes. And one of the, talking about health uh, worker, uh, our health force work, is it possible? And I'm just posing this out. Is it possible that some of them have been walking out because we haven't educated the public enough so that they would keep coming in, reoccurrence of COVID, not wanting to take the vaccine, all of those things that make the healthcare workers sick and tired of people not listening to science. So if we take the approach of engaging patients as partners in our healthcare, very much like, uh, even, even Disney does it with kids, by the way, uh, very much like the, the, the airline industry does, why can we implement that with our community and educate them so that they do the job for us. They can go into senior centers, into their uh, uh, churches, synagogues, temples, and basically teach what we've taught them about the science, about having the vaccine, about protecting themselves. And yet we don't do that. And I'm wondering if we are not falling short every single time. So what I'm basically asking is why don't we have the federal agency, I'm talking like CMS right now, uh, to rebring that concept back and help healthcare workers have much more success. It just makes makes sense to me. And I'm just I'm just a patient advocate, nothing else, but it just makes sense from logistic point that if if I go out and spread the word for you, I've done the job, by the way, without money, uh, Arjun, so you don't have to invest. Um, so so, it, so it's, it's kind of a freebie thing. I've done it in sepsis right here in Washington, D.C. with MedStar. Uh, I engaged the community side to go out and do the work for us, and it worked. It, it's, it's, it's successful. So, so I, I have two comments. One is politically incorrect, but I'm going to say it anyway. Next time we have a pandemic, make sure it's not electoral year. So that's the first thing. Because if we have different political views interfering with public health education, we have a conflict of interest. And that, I think, it's, it's part of the problem. And regardless of who's in power, we all need to be the United Health of America. The United, United States, not health, but both, both works. <laughs> United States with a United Health. And we really need to focus on, on what's the evidence and what can we do good for all, regardless of the color of your skin, your religion, or all your political views. What you mentioned, I think it's also key. We did it at our health system level, but I think if it was a more coordinated response would have been great. Very early on, our mayor included some of us um, in, in the health systems to come and give advice and work together 
to keep the business open. So we had to work with the senior centers and give advice and create guidelines for the local daycares and the restaurants. And each state I, and each almost every county had to do this. There was no central organized response. Like, should you keep a restaurant open with four tables or one table? So we have to hear the small business owners who were struggling how to keep their businesses open and try to work with them in what was safe versus what's realistic. To me, that was a very eye-opening experience because if I don't have a job, I don't have health insurance, I'm going to have a bigger problem. So you have to balance the economy with the safety and hearing from, from the people, you know, like you, like patient advocates, to me was important. When we deployed the vaccines, the same thing. We went to our community leaders in every religion and started in, engaging them and educating them so they can go and spread the word. But again, um, it's not enough. We have to do it and we have to be consistent. When we have mixed messages, I think that's a challenge. And I do think we can do way more with infection prevention, just hand hygiene. Uh, just if we pick hand hygiene and we can really do a stronger work educating the workforce and the patients and the kids in school and everyone, we would be in a much better position. And for some reason, we have still not been able to do what we could be doing just with hand hygiene. So I would love to hear your thoughts because I, I think you're, you're right. We need to engage everyone and everybody needs to own. They have to be part of the solution, not just part of the problem. Any other comments on that? All right, I believe Dr. Blazer, you have a question for Arjun. Yeah, yes, yeah, so Arjun, uh, I, I wanted to follow up on uh, what you were talking about, about decontamination uh, and uh, make a comment and see what you had in mind. And that is that decontamination is a two-edged sword. We want to uh, eliminate the pathogen, but it can lead to collateral damage. And um, in some cases, the collateral damage may be worse than the benefit. And uh, it seems to me that the, the, really the only kinds of decontamination we should be thinking about are narrow spectrum. Narrow to address very specific pathogens, not you know germicidal, not uh, anything that is broadly antimicrobial. I'd like to know your, your thoughts about that. Yeah, I thought you might have some interest in that, in that particular uh, item. We couldn't agree more. And, and I think this is why we view this as an innovation, right? If it was simply a matter of, oh, we'll just give everybody, you know, selective digestive decontamination and, you know, give them oral polymycin uh, and be done, polymyxin and be done with it, it wouldn't be an innovation. I think what we are talking about are actually microbiome preserving strategies, right? So maybe the decolonizing is Fecal, my, fecal microbiota transplant for a patient colonized with heavily colonized with CRE to restore their healthy microbiome, right? So I think it's it's not the blast of the colon with the broad spectrum antibiotics and get rid of everything. We are really seeking strategies that are microbiome uh, preserving and healthy microbiome reconstituting. We see that as the innovative approach that's needed. Obviously, that's music to my ears. Uh, I, I think I, I think it's great. You're you're talking about restoration. That's right. Uh, um, that's I'm right. still thinking decolonization, which could right. be a very narrow agent. It could. You, you know the yeah. uh, the, the uh, Klebsiella sure. specific agent, for right. example. We know enough right. about genomes yeah. that we should be able to invent that. Right, right. Or a phage or a monoclonal. I mean, I think there are lots of yeah. approaches, but but yeah. we see it fundamentally as restoration of the healthy microbiome yeah. um, in, in what we would want to do there. Yeah. Just, because fa be, just because there's so much microbial diversity, phages may not be adequate because there are too many Klebsiella's. Yeah. Right, right. Michael, did you have a comment on that? Well, and I, I would just add to it the, the conversation that we had on the 30th with FDA, you know, I think was a great introduction to this. And we considered it to be really the kickoff of a conversation about how we can get to this. And I would note, you know, I think to your point, Dr. Blazers, that there were several companies there who have products in development. And I think they're considering whether they have a product that is actually an antibiotic that could treat somebody or is actually better as a microbiome restorative. The only issue is that there's not a pathway for FDA to currently approve a restorative that is a that that really would serve a prevention purpose. So how do we create, you know, what are the clinical endpoints? What are the surrogate endpoints to actually show FDA where we could get a prevention product like that to market? And again, to reinforce Arjun's point, 
we're not talking about an antibiotic that's essentially used to, you know, blow up the gut and create more problems or create further resistance pressure. These are unique agents that don't do those things and that we don't want to open up a new pathway for, you know, existing antibiotics to be used inappropriately. We want to create uh, a pathway for these very unique agents to be used in a preventative purpose and setting and figuring out what's the best way to do that. And that sounds like great progress. It's great, Carl. I think um, Dr. Bender's had his name card up, but I I would like to ask Dr. Bender if you would comment while you're while you're commenting on the educational and workforce needs of the agriculture community. Thank you, uh, Dr. Palmer. I have to apologize. I'm really slow. Uh, and, and, and so actually this comment is a guideline comment. And actually the reason, the reason that I brought it up is actually the communication uh, piece that, that came up. Uh, you know, one of the things that we saw uh, with, with COVID is that, you know, we were trying to come up with, or at least uh, I was part of a, a large group to come up with basically uh, agriculture worker guidelines. And you can imagine an agriculture worker in Florida, a strawberry picker, or a lettuce grower in California, or a grape grower in in Oregon, or a swine production person in Iowa, uh, and trying to come up with guidelines. And so um, this is a long-winded way of saying evidence-based guidelines, especially broad spectrum like that, was was uh, very slow, and went through multiple agencies. So we, you know, we had the alphabet soup of agencies that wanted to review and clear. By that time, the pandemic was well into it, and many of us were really struggling with what to do. And actually, the industries associations actually picked up the ball for the most part and were asking, well, what do we do and how do we engage? Or they engaged their state health department. So um, I do believe that there is a need to think about our communication strategies and our guideline development to make sure that it is, it is timely, thinking about, you know, it has to be good but not perfect. And I think one of the challenges that we have now, too, is our communication and how we are not making a mess by changing as we learn more, because clearly we didn't know a lot and we were continuing to learn. So, one, we, uh, the CDC and, and USDA and FDA are trusted resources. We need to make sure that, that that stays the same. I love to be able to refer up. Jeff Bender didn't say, but, you know. The FDA said is is much better, uh, and uh, so I do believe that we need to um, revisit how we do guideline development, how we can quickly provide that and provide that guidance uh, a little bit more quickly. So that's just to emphasize. So getting back to the education and, and workforce uh, piece, I think that that's that's actually part of it is to think about um, how do we have those partnerships early. So really working closely with the industry to understand the industry needs. To, to then be able to say, well, this is what we know, this is what we don't know, this is what we, we hope that we can provide some guidance for you. Thanks for sharing your information. We'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. In the meantime, this is the best way that we're going to be able to house your, you know, uh, 20 workers in the same room, you know, uh, you know, in a strawberry field. I mean, uh, you know, th those are just nightmare uh, scenarios to try to come up with some guidance there. But um, it's really important to do it. The other thing to really for education to really be brought up is the issue of basically understanding language and culture. Uh, so, you know, I empathize, especially if Creole and Spanish are your, are your other primary languages. But if you go into a slaughter plant and you've got Korean and Russian and Ukrainian, and uh, then, you know, it's just a, it's an amazing challenge that needs to be addressed. So part of that is that ongoing education. The other thing is that posters don't work. Um, one of the things that I learned early in my education is that men don't read posters. Women are much better at it. There's scientific studies. I think there was nursing studies that did that. Uh, and uh, so basically, we need to think about different communication strategies uh, um, and how we engage. So uh, those are those are some uh, challenges that we have. And I also think that when we think about, especially uh, trying to reach the agricultural workforce, I will say that our our extension. Uh, has been greatly diminished across our country. We don't have folks out in the community that are working uh, with those those producers and those those uh, understanding what they need. Um, but also, they're not working with oftentimes the worker 
Uh, so not only do we have to work with the producer, but we need to get make sure that our extension folks are actually working with workers and understanding what the workers need. So I'll get off my my uh, pedestal right now. So uh, that was great, Dr. Abba. So I know it may sound like science fiction to some of you, but there is a lot of innovation in technology, and one of them is digital twins. So potentially, and this is already happening in other areas where you have digital twins in air force industry or, or you know, using uh, augmented intelligence to predict traffic accidents and air control. So you don't expect until the airplane crashes, you have already worked. It's more than a simulation. It's really like virtual reality, augmented reality and XR, and you're creating these scenarios and preparing for them. And that's why the air uh, force industry is so safe. And I think in healthcare, we tend to lag behind many other industries, but this is an opportunity, at least one of my recommendations, that we allocate funding for very intentional use of these augmented realities and technologies, because I could come and simulate 10 strawberry field workers getting this infection, and in a simulation, you know, virtual reality world or in a metaverse, we can all go in and look at the problem and predict that what could happen so we can put the solutions in place before they happen. Um, in silico trials and doing, you know, digital twins is the same thing. It's a digital twin in which you can predict how somebody's going to react to a medication, a vaccine, adverse events. So in the pharmaceutical industry, the potential here is huge. And some of the private companies are already moving towards that. I don't know if the government has looked into it and what kind of partnerships could happen allocating funding for, for technology with measurable outcomes, not just pouring money, you know, and, and, and not, not being able to then, you know, um, disseminate it. It has to be something that is cost effective and that brings value um, to our patient care. Excellent. So just as we finish up, I uh, um, want to ask a question, if anybody has responses around, how does the management worker relationship impact occupational safety in these types of scenarios? And is there anything we need to be thinking about there in, in terms of innovation or best practices? Dr. Bender, it looks like you have a comment. Uh, yeah, this actually gets, uh, um, I, I appreciate that comment or question. Uh, one, because um, uh, some of the work that uh, we've been doing um, is the promotors, uh, basically the the folks that actually, you know, are, are workers that become lead workers that actually interface with management. One of the things that we have found, you know, with dairy workers is that if we can identify a promotor who actually will promote the safety and health of their fellow workers, uh, who will translate that language, we'll also empower them to approach their management staff and say, hey, you know, this gate doesn't work, uh, or uh, I got stuck with this needle. Uh, you know, and so um, uh, supporting that type of community health worker uh, model uh, and actually translating that community health worker model uh, more broadly across the U.S. I think will be really important, especially when we think of underserved communities uh, and basically health equity issues. You know, I think this is a really important issue, and, and it, I think, speaks to this issue of, that we've been talking about a lot, and that's the issue of trust. Uh, and, and is there trust? in what the management is saying about infection control. And, you know, Terry, to, to your point, you know, I think we agree, like we hear you, their flexibility would be very helpful. What we hear when we talk to some people is do not give healthcare facilities flexibility, because if you tell them you can either give me a 10 cent surgical mask or a $1 respirator, guess what they're going to do? They're going to lock up all the respirators and they're not going to give them to us. Even though we know that's the best, they're going to do what's most cost effective for them. And that's a trust thing. Uh, and I think it's really, really important. I mean, I think you hear these same stories uh, and building that trust, rebuilding that trust is gonna be fundamentally important here. But I, I think you've hit on a really, really important gap and problem. Um, I'll echo um, the, the whole trust issue. I think that's something that we need to really build into our cultures. Um, and, you know, Speaking of cultures, I think part of building that trust, especially in the agricultural um, sector, is understanding everyone else's culture. Because, you know, yeah, we, we, we're here, we're in the United States, that's all well and good, but our teams come from everywhere in the world. And 
understanding, you know, where they're coming from and how, you know, they approach things in the culture that they're used to is very, very important, not only in getting your message across, but in continuing to develop that trust um, between management, um, you know, and, you know, anyone else. So, you know, as a, a fairly new um, manager, it, it's really hard to do that. I mean, trust is really hard and it's, it's not something that you can say, just assume that, you know, your employees are going to trust you. You have to trust them as well. And that means learning more about them, um, whether that be, you know, anything going on at work wise or anything or anything about their history or their culture that they come from. I think that's very, very important. All right. Thank you for those responses. So uh, as we finish up, Dr. Fate, you get the last question or comment. <laughs> this is just going back to the workforce question, and um, I'm not sure exactly where I'm headed with this, but I'm curious what your thoughts are or what it means, if there is, in fact, um, a gender gap in the IP workforce and if there are ways to address that and if that relates to salaries and um, attraction to the field or anything along those lines. Uh, I can tell you that it, it reflects nursing and MPHs, which are predominantly female, but their salaries are pretty good. And that's why we have trouble getting people to go back to school, et cetera. And I just want to say one thing about the VR simulation. Uh, that was mentioned, and that is that's better than cross-training because the VR you can do uh, in real time. The cross-training, we've tried that, and everybody quits. You have to train them again, You have to, and they don't keep up their skill for the cross-training. So it's a new way, an innovative way, to make sure that there's the skill available in real time when they need it. And we're, we actually have a grant from ARC, thank you, right now to look at VR for PPE preparation. Dr. Remen, did you have a comment? No, I just echo what Elaine said that um, infection prevention is predominantly female. And so if there's a gap, it's actually a non-traditional gap. Um, but it reflects what nursing, what the nursing profession looks like because infection prevention primarily um, recruits, or infection prevention primarily recruits from the nursing profession. All right, well, I would like to um, show her a, a, a one last comment, yep. So the feeling in general among the workers is that the managers don't really care about them. So to show that the managers care, truly care is very important. It's now well known with many studies that women actually make better managers. So maybe they do well in this profession, so that's good. But, you know, I saw in, uh, after the Fukushima disaster, I had visited the chemical plant, not the nuclear plant, and I found out that the workers were very happy because the man, they sent all the workers to run out to safety. The heads, the managers, the, the vice presidents, they are the ones who stayed behind to shut the chemical plants down. In the U.S., I can tell you, the managers would have been out first and the workers would have been there behind. And that was a real lesson I learned at Fukushima. And so it's truly important we know that the managers have to now start caring for the workers. All right. Appreciate that. So um, as we draw this module to a close, I want to express our appreciation to the uh, speakers on the panel and um, really appreciate the discussion. Now the working group has a lot of information to take back and distill down and figure out how we make that into actionable items. But um, hopefully the council will join me in thanking our panelists. And now, Jamana. Thank you, Dr. Plummer. Well, that's the end of all of our modules and our presenters. Uh, we're gonna take a 10 minute break so we can shift things around. And next it'll be our innovation spotlight. <clears throat> where we have uh, four companies that have signed up to share with you their technologies and advancements as it relates to combating a AMR. And then we're gonna do our round robin, so get your thoughts together. I'm sure Dr. Blazer is gonna ask you. Um, thank you all so much. Grab something real quick and please meet us back here.
produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.